Okay, so I, I, let's see if we can get started. So welcome everyone to the Penn State Shenango. Okay. So I, I, let's see we, to, to the Penn State Shenango's Venture Points. So Third welcome everyone startup to challenge, the Penn State Shenango, sponsored in collaboration with the e Center at Linden Penn State Shenango's Venture Points, as well as Northwest. Third welcome everyone startup challenge, Penn State Shenango, sponsored in collaboration with the e Center at Linden Penn State Shenango's Venture Points, as well as Northwest. Welcome everyone startup challenge, Penn State sponsored in collaboration as well as individuals that applied internally through Penn State. So we have received wonderful ideas from teams and individuals within the local community as well as the Penn State community. Uh, Venture Point, to give a little background information, is Penn State Shenango's think tank incubator and is a signature program of the Invent Penn State Commonwealth-wide initiative to spur economic development, job creation, and student career success. In total, there are 21 launch box innovation hubs embedded within the Commonwealth campus communities across the uh, state and provide a wide array at no cost uh, for resources needed by entrepreneurs and investors. So you can find more information about the Venture Point um, as well as uh, the Invent Penn State Commonwealth Initiative at invent.psu.edu and I can link that in the chat as well. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a collaborative effort, so I'd like to introduce the uh, two organizations as well. Uh, I'll start with the Penn Northwest Development Corporation. This is a Mercer County's Economic Development Agency. So they are a conduit and catalyst for economic growth and prosperity since 1985 and have existed to enrich the lives of those who live, work, and play in Mercer County by attracting investment uh, that creates and retains family wage uh, sustaining jobs. Uh, in addition, we have Linden Point. So the Linden Point Development Corporation is a startup business incubator offering entrepreneurs a supportive environment, including infrastructure, education, training, mentorship, and a network of serviced providers to help turn ideas into successful businesses. So as I mentioned, uh, we uh, you know, as in uh, Penn State, have welcomed uh, several ideas from, uh, you know, internal to Penn State and from the local community. All of these ideas were reviewed by uh, judges and evaluated upon. So it's my pleasure to introduce those judges. And afterwards, uh, I will introduce the uh, top four selected uh, idea, ideas and uh, the uh, the developers of those ideas will uh, have a five minute pitch and that that will be followed by a five minute q a session with the judges so it's, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce georgia macris who is a assistant teaching professor of business at penn state shenango jeff meyer who's the executive director of the e-center at linden point and gary Dovey who is the executive director of Penn Northwest Development Corporation. So I hope I got everybody's name right. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, tonight's uh, presentation's format will follow a five minute pitch presented by the contestants that is followed by a five minute Q&A with the judges. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first contestant, uh, Lauren Cuccino, who is pitching uh, the idea of Illumilit. So, uh, Lauren, whenever you're ready, please take it away. Hi. Let me share my screen. So, my name is Lauren Cuncio, and my idea is called Illumilit. Um, Illumilit is books that are charged with glow in the dark properties, and I decided to start this, um, well, not really start, but come up with the idea um, while I was in the car on a long trip and I was kind of angry that I had to put my book down once it started to get dark out. Um, and it occurred to me like, you know, what if they just, these pages just glowed in the dark? Um, if my retainers can, so can book pages. <laughs> so that's my theory and how I started this idea. Uh, so the problem that I noticed was 
not just like on these car rides, but if you have a roommate and they need to get sleep and you need to like, they need total darkness. You can't have a light on. Um, in college dorms, this is a prime example. Um, if you don't have access to light, like I wouldn't in the car. And with <laughs> the book lamp batteries, those die so fast. And it's really hard to find like a good solid book lamp that you can just click onto the pages. So I thought it would be much more convenient just to put the glow in the dark properties in the pages. That way you don't need any external light sources. So how it would work the glow um, in the dark is phosphors are infused into these pages and absorb light and that makes them glow. Uh, currently my idea is just in the idea stage. I haven't really had any experimental phases, um, but I, I would like to, I'd like to learn more about um, the phosphors and how to infuse them. And that would definitely take some funding though. <laughs> this is mainly marketed towards avid readers of paperback novels. Obviously you can't do this on a computer. That was actually part of the other reason that I decided to come up with this idea is because I don't like reading books online. And I know there are a lot of people who also don't like that. And in the age of the pandemic, where we have to stare at screens all day long, it's kind of refreshing to stare at a piece of paper. So my current competition are really children, primarily children's books and books that are like nighttime themed um, and are meant to like, in, like wow kids with, um, glow in the dark features and pictures. Um, there's no like really adult books with a, this different kind of glow in the dark properties, not not intended for pictures, but to simply be able to see the page. So my total available market, I took the global literacy rate from the total world population and came up with $2.3 trillion. The sales addressable market was the, I took the percentage of American readers and the population or the United States population and got 952.7 billion. And the sales obtainable market, I primarily focused on the East Coast since I live in Pennsylvania and I'm planning to go to college in either Tennessee or New York, which are also in that area. Um, and I took the percentage, I divided the percent total percentage of readers across the United States and just applied it to the East Coast. My vision for this project is it has to start with the idea um, and then it would obviously have to go through many experimental stages. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of bumps in the road that I wouldn't even know would get there until I try it. Um, eventually, once it gets perfected, I would like to start growing this and expanding this so that eventually all books can have the opportunity to be published with glow in the dark properties. I hope to have this as common as picking whether you want a book to be a hardback or paperback. You know, you can choose between glow in the dark or not glow in the dark. And I'm the founder and there's my contact information. Thank you so much. Uh, Lauren, this is uh, Gary Doby from Penn Northwest. Uh, re regarding your uh, the financial section there and and your potential sales, have have you dug deeper on those potential sales? Because those were very uh, large numbers I was seeing there. I uh, actually I took probably the broadest numbers that I could with that. Um, it's it was really hard to find um, the number of people who are like active readers and public like buy books. Um, I also, I multiplied the publishing cost. Um, it's any, it can range anywhere from like a hundred dollars to about 6,000. So I took the average and added about $400 to that. Um, and those, those were the numbers that I came up with. I definitely expect that the, they will be lower. All right. I'm just curious, uh, since we're dealing with uh, glow in the dark uh, material and that, uh, have, have you researched any uh, potential cost of actually uh, doing the uh, glow in the dark, dark book or whatever? Um, it really, it ranges. Um, I kind of, I had a hard time coming up with the glow in the dark for the book, considering that this would be the entire page of an entire novel and not a toy, which is plastic. Um, this isn't really done too much. Um, 
So it would kind of be something new that okay. I that I don't quite have those numbers for. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, Lauren. This is Jeff Meyer. Hi. Um, quick question. Hi. The quick question I have is that so uh, you believe that in terms of uh, competition, the digital technology that th this is. You, you do not think there'd be a, a crossover or a conflict with how books are read and bought today online, either with uh, Windows technology or iOS technology with iPads um, and tablets. Uh, you, you believe that this would be a very separate and distinct market for people that like to hold a book in their hands when they're reading? Is that? Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. Thoughts on that? Yeah. Um. I personally, I, I really hate reading online and I know a lot of people who are the same way. Um, so I think this would be an entirely separate market. I feel like reading online is a little bit of the more modern way to do it, but I feel like the more avid, um, true readers like to hold those books. I mean, I think this could be done with as much as textbooks. I'm not, I don't think that that would necessarily be super practical um, just because of the coloring and the images that are in them. but. Yeah, I, I think this is totally separate and would focus more on paperback books. Okay, thank you. Hi, Lauren. This is Georgia uh, from Penn State, uh, Shenango. And my question is, how did you derive or come up with the ingredients to use for the glow in the, arc, um, glow in the dark ink? See, that's something that I actually, I want to work with somebody on um, cause I'm, I'm not a scientist. I simply just came up with the idea. Um, but I know that it is phosphors is what makes like, that is the prime ingredient in any glow in the dark substance. Um, that's what's in like the glow sticks and any, basically anything that can glow in the dark. Okay. Thank you. Hello, so Lauren, a wonderful presentation. Let me open up to the audience. Are there any other additional questions or comments? Okay, so if I may, I'll just add a, a few comments there, Lauren, um, in, in hopes to uh, you know, better prepare you in, in, in terms of uh, the materials that you're using. So I'm not sure if you've done any research about phosphorus. There are generally two types, like uh, white phosphorus and red. And the, the variation between the two depend on the phase in which they are uh, forming. Uh, so the way the atoms basically align themselves. And there could be, potentially be some dangerous um, aspects of using that, depending on uh, how it's applied to the paper and, and such. But um, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll say that it's a good idea and you should look into it a little bit more. Thank you. So I'll uh, just uh, allot a few a few minutes for the judges to uh, score the, the presentation, and uh, then we can move on. I think a better way to provide feedback to me, if, if the judges could just give a thumbs up when they're finished the scoring, that would be great. And that's uh, in the reactions tab of Zoom. Reactions, so. Hmm. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm good, Matt. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the second contestant, uh, Marissa Nitcher. So uh, whenever you're ready, Marissa. Hello. Okay. Hello. Hello. 
So my invention I came up with is called Note to Go. So, you know, with everything being online, uh, we're getting overwhelmed with missing deadlines to projects. Uh, there's been times where we can forget important emails with everything tr transitioning onto Zoom. And being a student myself, I'm getting overwhelmed with multiple assignments. So especially with being a student and teaching and teachers at home learning and teaching, our motivation has been an all-time low. Uh, we're getting overwhelmed with Zoom meetings, with assignment due dates, whatever the case might be. So like I said, the students were missing multiple assignments and it's not preparing us for exams. That's what's gonna help us in the future. Uh, teachers, they're also getting overwhelmed with assigning their due dates on top of juggling multiple classes. So I kind of asked myself, like, how can we all fix this, that we're all organized and on the same page? So that's where I came up with the uh, interactive application called note to go How does this work? It's going to be an interactive app. So it has reminders of due dates. You can do it the day before, five hours before, even an hour before to say, hey, you didn't turn this assignment, you better want to get it done. Um, you can merge with the school softwares like D2L, Canvas, uh, Google Classrooms. And it's an easier way to communicate with students and teachers instead of bombarding with multiple emails, you can do it straight from my app. And it has a lot of other uh, tiny little features included. So for my main target audience, I was shooting for students, especially since we are the ones who tend to be a full-time student with all the classes and trying to stay on top of the game on top of teachers who are the ones who makes the syllabus and assign the due dates. And after I sat back and thought, who else can benefit from this, even businesses. Uh, I was talking to my father about it and he even said like, I could really use this since I work from home now, I'm always on Zoom meetings and I tend to forget. So I guess anyone could really use this for their own personal use as well. So for the business model, if purchased through a school or a business, they, all their students and employees would want to experience the full application. However, I thought through a personal use, the user will have a freemium model where the app itself could be, let's say 99 cents, but if they want to include certain features that aren't included, they can purchase that either as a bundle or by themselves, say like 99 cents extra or however we want to market this. So for my competitions, obviously Canvas, Blackboard, D2L, Google Classrooms, they are my competition. They have some type of calendar involved. However, they do not give the reminder to say, you have this assignment missing, you haven't completed yet. So instead of looking at them as a competition, I will look at them as an opportunity to collaborate with them and have those assignments that are in their app to merge into mine so the students don't have to worry about adding something into their calendar, it would automatically just go through with the app's help. So my overall goal would be in an advising team. I know nothing about when it comes to applications, making an app, creating an app, so I would need help with that. I would need some type of seed money to get started. Like I said, I'm not too sure about the application world, so that would benefit as well and partnerships such as if the school would want to purchase the app through their own way, or if, like I said, Canvas, D2L, they want to join on my team and work with me. So that's my app, Note to Go, the reminder to be successful. Thank you. So Marissa, this is uh, Jeff Meyer. Um, question I have is, um, I, I think there, uh, you did mention in state and emphasize there is competition out there. Uh, but your thought is, uh, because there are a lot of calendaring tools, and I believe there are some uh, number of alert um, tools uh, on the market. But your, your point is that this, um, you would like to see, you would like to take and make that an advantage where you would build interfaces or you're, you would propose to build application program interfaces to these solutions, um, which would enhance your product. Was that your overall thought in terms of competition? Yes, yeah, so the way that I kind of thought about going about it was those platforms could either collaborate with my app or the school itself. Uh, my idea was 
none of those apps give you a reminder to let you an exam or an uh, assignment coming up. So that's where mine would come into play and remind the students, the employees, whatever the case might be. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Marissa, this is Gary Doby from Penn Northwest. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, you did do some research on your uh, pricing of the model uh, at, at 99 cents. Have you, have you dug any deeper on, you know, uh, the full blown uh, or an estimate for a full blown uh, application? Um, I wasn't able to find a full blown uh, price mm -hmm. because a lot of the applications that I found tend to be free. So it was kind of hard to put a price tag on something when other apps tend to be free and have the feature bundle that I had mentioned. Okay. It, it, it leads to one other question there. Uh, uh, with the free models that exist uh, all over the arrays there, uh, how would you perfect this to uh, beat that model out for me to pay, pay for it? So for the basic model, I was thinking it would give you the bare minimum where it could just say, uh, just the reminder, hey, you didn't finish it. But if you were to pay extra, you can get um, exclusive, like uh, I had mentioned a to-do list in my essay where it gives you everything you still need to get done for the week. Uh, yeah. Other okay. features like reminders for personal use. All right. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Marissa, this is uh, George John Mackers with Penn State. So, my question lies in, you know, normal business conditions of rivalry. So, once your competitors realize what you're doing, how would you sustain your competitive advantage? if they were just not to incorporate what you're doing into their product? Um, I didn't think too much about that one. That was a good question. I would just say, keep up with everything that's going on and just try my best to be the newest app. Okay. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Marissa. It's a wonderful presentation. Are there any other questions from the audience or comments? Okay, great. So uh, I thought your presentation uh, was uh, was very nice. Uh, I will say, you know, I think some of the business models for the free apps nowadays uh, include some advertisements. So you could consider that. I think that that must be quite successful because every time I go to YouTube, I have to watch one to two ads every time. And I'm sure mm -hmm. the people sponsoring the ads have to pay a good amount for that. Um, otherwise, that's uh, fantastic. So thank you for your presentation. I'll just allow for a few minutes for the judges to finish their scoring. Okay, for me, Matt. Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much. So next we have Sabrina Boots. So Sabrina, uh, if you're there, if you're ready, please go ahead.
Okay, so uh, our business is called Full Access, and our product will come in if you were so. Find, imagine yourself walking into a uh, your first networking event or trade show, full of hope for making a meaningful business connection, but terrified of the process of finding the right person you were seeking and striking up a uh, conversation. What makes the process of all of this so intimidating is the only form of identification you have is a name tag that tends to be flipped the wrong way, tucked under a jacket, or not visible for whatever reason. This inconvenience is amplified when you're standing in a sea of unfamiliar people, and because of this, you find yourself hugging the wall, embarrassed, frustrated, observing others around you who have cracked the code of networking, wishing you had done the same. Enter full access, your tool for catalyzing meaningful conversations like a cheat sheet, business card, attendance monitor, all wrapped in one. So how does it work? Each attendee will be supplied with an RFID fob, which they will scan on a card reader whenever they enter a new room. After the scan, the attendees have gained access on their phone to the information of the people around them, including their name, company they work for, contact information, and a picture similar to what you would use on LinkedIn. All the information will be on a local server during the event and will be discarded immediately following the event. Here's a brief overview of how to use our product. In the top left corner of the slide is a picture of the components of our prototype, which are the fobs and card readers. Using the QR code on the fob, you are able to get to the website. Moving down, once you scan your fob on the card reader, you will be entered into that room. On the first phone screen, you can see what the home screen of our website looks like. From this page, you can select a room or a general overview of everyone who is currently at the event. The next screen is what a room looks like and then most importantly, the last phone screen shows what it looks like when you click on an individual attendee's profile. Networking, as we, can, as we explained, can be a hard code to crack. On all sides of the social scale, people can improve their skills with our product. I'm Kevin Walton, and I consider myself more extroverted, but my struggle with networking is I'm a social person, but I find it hard to connect with the right people or know who around me could be worthwhile to talk to. Knowing where the people around me work, what they look like, and their job title definitely helps me in this process. I'm Megan Lucio, and I'm more of an extrovert. What I find the most daunting about networking is finding the best way to have a productive conversation. It helps to know what you have in common with someone, where to begin the conversation, which our product helps solve by providing useful information such as their company and their job title. And I'm <clears> Sabrina <throat> Boots, and I fall on the introverted side of the scale. I've found myself in situations where I feel unable to begin to start a conversation when and if I do find the courage, I don't want to waste it on meaningless connections or unproductive conversation, which I believe Full Access helps to alleviate the stress of. We currently have two mentors helping us build our product. We have Nicole French, who's been helping us with our marketing and our presentations. She has seven years of experience in the event industry and is the event coordinator at Buell Mansion. And we also have AJ Hammond, who's been helping us build our final products as he's pursuing a career in cybersecurity at Mount Union. Also, we'd like to thank Gerard Boots, an experienced computer programmer who helped us tremendously with developing our website and our current prototype. Currently, we have no direct competition for our product. While there are apps on the market, they are marketed towards the attendee to purchase, which would decrease the total number of people at the event who would use it and feature a slew of other cluttered and unnecessary features to up their cost. Of course, traditional name tags are a competitor. However, as we mentioned before, they tend not to be visible or depending on their placement can lead to embarrassing eye gazing. While we are currently focusing on marketing this product to convention centers and event venues, there's potential for it to expand to other capacities such as in schools, at weddings, nonprofits, or even in the workplace, which we hope to venture into into the future. So far, we have spoken to an experienced networking event planner, Sharis Marrera, and an attendee of networking events, Andrew Roscoe. Our planned revenue model is a leasing-based model where we will lease out our product to convention centers and event venues that hold corporate networking events. Our unit cost for a card reader, a singular fob, and including someone to program the system will be about $40.18. Our profit margin is 16.25% with our product being technology related, yet hardware. The main box we will have to purchase this will be roughly $300, including 225 fobs and five card readers. Next time you find yourself becoming too acquainted with the wall at a networking event or a trade show, take a glance at your phone, find your target, and confidently strike up a conversation with the assistance of our product, Full Access. Thank you.
This is Gary Dovey from Penn Northwest. Uh, I believe an uh, excellent presentation. And, and I believe that you actually have some cost in, for this operating uh, uh, model already, uh, don't you? Yes, we have a working prototype as of right now. And, 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 and are you looking to actually to get these uh, first step uh, off, off the ground soon or what, what's your timeline on that? Right now we're looking to condense our box as shown in the one thing. It is just a Raspberry Pi and um, a little like, contraption, I guess, if you want to put it that way. And so we want to contra like, contrast it. What would you say? Like, we, we want to make it smaller. Condense everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so we were working with AJ to help us build a more put together, like, final Which product instead of just like a rough prototype. We're hoping to have that in May and then maybe get off the ground with that. Oh, all right. Well, thank you very much. Excellent uh, presentation, I believe. Thank you. Hi team, this is Jeff Meyer. Um, my question is, uh, uh, I have attended in my career like major um, IT um, conventions or conferences like uh, SAP Sapphire and Oracle World, um, major events like that. And then when, when I go, when I would attend those, they would have um, the um, uh, attendance uh, download an app that would provide a full roster for all information for the roster of thousands of people at these events and also map out the entire, you know, if it's a week long event, uh, where all the major breakout rooms are at, what tick, what, um, what's the subject matter for each of the breakouts and all that good stuff. Um, as you def uh, design this solution, have you, are, are you aware of those um, applications that are out there for major um, corporate events like that? And if so, what does your application provide or add to that uh, that is been missing? I, I believe part of it is um, personal information, right? That that it not only it's not a one way where you're getting this information downloaded to your app, but it also is uploading information for other people to. Uh, um, um, obtain basic information about um, the the owner or yourself. So my, I guess my question is, have you looked at those uh, applications out there to see what uh, how yours um, measures up to those? Yeah, we have. And um, so like, like you said, ours is more personal. So when, when you would scan ours, when we said scan into a room, that meant like the physical room that you're in, when you would scan the, the tag, it would show you everybody in that room and you could click on them and you'd see their picture and their name and the company that they worked for. So it, it, ours would work more as like a, a conversation starter. So you have that information and you know that I would want to talk to whoever because they work for whatever company and that would be a potential opportunity for myself. Also, there, there are these uh, apps that apps and then, you know, programs that bigger businesses have, like summit was one of them, but sometimes we looked at, they cost money. And even if they were free, this, the idea of this is that it could go to, you know, at any place, not just the bigger corporate event, events. Okay. All right. And one, then one more add on question of that. So, and then uh, you are taking a close look at the um, security aspect of it and the privacy aspect of it based on the information um, that is shared, right? Yeah. So the way that we would have it set up is that um, it would be on a, a private server that would be, you know, programmed prior to the event. So when you leave, all the information will be discarded and nobody outside, nobody that's not at that event could see any information. And also it wouldn't be, you know, it would all be discarded and none of it's that personal. Like you would probably find all that stuff on LinkedIn or just like a Google of somebody. So. Yeah, I'd like to add in on your last question. I think like another feature of our product that's really nice is it shows you who is currently at the event. Like I feel like what you're like what you were saying, like it just shows you a list of everyone who is invited to the event. But I think what makes our product so great is because you can see who is in the individual room at that moment, like it's live and then or you can just see a general overview of all the attendees who are there at that moment. And then when you leave the event, you'd be scanned out. So you don't have to waste time looking for somebody who might not be there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, so this is Georgia Magris um, of Penn State. And I too have uh, participated and exhibited um, in major conventions at, in New York City at the Javits Center, at the McCormick Place uh, as part of the chocolate industry and also through a lot of teaching conferences. And you know, I think about some of the topics and courses that I've taught and have lived like personal selling uh, and the art of selling and the art of personal relationships and getting out there to network. So I'm thinking, you know, it's almost like um, taking that away from the person uh, and, you know, what if the people who are there decide that they don't want to share that information to be necessarily sought out and then they're not listed, what are the effects on them uh, from just the natural order of you know, being in a room and going up to people and starting to talk to them and finding interest in perhaps a common interest or in learning something new that may not have been a common interest. I would say the only thing that it takes away from like networking as of right now is the stress of going up to someone new. At least you know that they're a person you want to talk to. And even if it is someone that you don't know, that you might want to talk to, you can still go up to them. It only gives you simple information. And if someone were to want to not supply the information, we hope that everyone will because it is a private browser. So like no one can really get onto it except for who is at that event. But if they weren't, um, the contact information that it would be would just be like an email. So it wouldn't be anything personal. And mostly everyone who would attend this would have a LinkedIn profile. So it'd be pretty much the same as that. Yeah, and you wouldn't have to participate if you didn't want to, obviously. But the product is not meant to take away conversation. It's meant to be an aid to help productive conversations. So like, in no way, shape, or form is it supposed to be like a social media where you would take away that in-person connect, like actual conversation. Mm -hmm. But it's meant more to help like catalyze those conversations and make opportunities. Yeah, okay. like... All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we do have a, a question <clears throat> that was posted in the chat. How does the FOB make, make networking easier than using an application competitor, something like guidebook? So in app, like any kind of app that, that you would use outside of like a corporate app they would give to you when you sign up for the event, but like outside of anything like uh, LinkedIn or something like that. This is when you go to the event, this is just given to you. So everybody there would be using it opposed to you. Like if you were just using LinkedIn, that would be your personal choice to use that. And maybe not everybody there would be using an app, if that makes sense. Okay, I hope that answers uh, the question that was posted in the chat. Uh, I do have a question myself. Is there the ability within the app to uh, message, like uh, send personal messages to other people that would be in the same room? As of right now, there's not just because that would somewhat take away the networking like lifestyle, I guess. It would take away from going up to this person. And we hope that our product would help them talk to this person so that way they could get this information and talk to them outside of it. Mm -hmm. So that way they could like connect, get phone numbers if wanted, and that way they could message that way. Yeah, uh, the reason I ask is because I, I've been to several conferences where uh, maybe there's somebody presenting on their work and, uh, you know, the, the, the time frames for which the, the people present and, and answer questions uh, is very short, it's very limited. And sometimes people will have uh, additional questions and I've seen it before, basically the people in the audience will surround the individual that uh, done their presentation and ask questions. And, you know, I thought it for a second, it may be very useful if you were able to send a personal message to the individual and say, hey, uh, I have additional questions about your, um, about your presentation or maybe I'm willing to collaborate with you. I have this idea would you be available to talk with me at, at this time or whatever time works best for you? And, and that would make uh, approaching the individual a little bit easier. Yeah. Well, they have like their contact information, like their email, so you can use that to get in contact with them later. So I know what you're saying, like you can't message them while you're at the event, 
but I think our overall overarching goal was to help catalyze conversations. And then I just know some people would use the like direct messaging feature to kind of not have the conversation. Yeah, it would be a substitute for a conversation where we just want this to catalyze and be used as like a little bit of a cheat sheet to help you get out there. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, very nice presentation. I went to a lot, a few minutes uh, for the judges to conduct their uh, scoring. Okay, for me, not. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, let me introduce our, our fourth and final contestant. It, it, it is a group presentation uh, uh, with Nikolai Dubosh and uh, Ryder Rust. Uh, hi, can everyone see us? Yes, I can. Okay. Yes. All right. Get to present, get to hit share screen. I know. Uh, okay, so screen share. Da -da -da. Share. Okay, can you guys see that? Yeah, they can. They just want to talk. All right, we're ready. Okay, and just move it over. How? Like this? Grab it. Yeah, that's good. Okay. <clears throat> hi, my name is Nikolai Dobosh. And hi, I'm Ryder Rust. Who are we? We are two college students who went to high school together with the same entrepreneurial mindset. Where are we from? We and our business are located in Hermitage, Pennsylvania in Mercer County. And what are we? We are Mahio Verde. Let's start out with a story. So you're at a family vacation and it's time to take family pictures, but you can't wear that nice white dress that you wanna wear, that tank top or your flip flops. Why? Because you're sunburned. One out of three Americans each year get sunburn. Sunburn causes immediate and long-term health conditions, discomfort while sleeping, walking, and anything else you do during the day. And it makes it very complicated to wear the clothes that you want to wear. This is where the Mahia Verde is applied. Our company takes fabric and infuses it with aloe to make aloe strips. Magnets are added to the fabric to act as clips for clothing Articles like hat brims, swimsuits, clothing straps, sandals, and just like the strap in this picture. So how does it work? Maya Verde gives immediate relief with our soothing aloe vera strips. It protects with the calendula flowers that are infused in our aloe vera strips within our product. The aloe also heals when it sinks into your skin, allowing your fashion sense to come back alive, being able to wear your clothes. And you may ask how our product works. It's simple. Apply the strip to any article of clothing and it will help with the healing and protection of the skin and also eliminate friction. We have created a prototype and we have also gained partners. One of our partners is Good Nature in Greenville. They have said that they will support us with our, the aloe and the flowers that we need to use to infuse into our product. Starboard cruise ships, we have also been in the Con we have also been in contact with the past year saying that we can sell our product on their cruise ships. We also have mentors. One of our mentors is Alana. She has said this product has the potential to evolve into a line of products and would be perfect for after quarantine vacations. We also conducted a Reddit poll with 70 people saying, 73 people saying they would buy our product right now. 50% would use our product right now, and 46 people agree with our starting price at $20 for our product. Our opportunity. According to iMark, a leading market company research, the aloe industry is worth 
expected to grow from 552 million from 2018 to 915 million in 2024. As you can see, we're in a growing industry involved with natural remedies. <clears throat> our competition also gives us opportunity as our product is very unique. We lack competitors, which gives us zero competition pretty much. Nobody creates aloe vera strips to give comfort while wearing clothes. Some create aloe like you can buy at the store and you can put it on your skin for relaxing and healing for your sunburn, but none actually create strips that you can put on your straps so you can go out and take your family pictures and go to the beach without the friction of the straps or your hat or your swimsuit waist or even your flip-flops rubbing against your skin. Our business model is business to business. We are going to be selling our product to starboard cruises and they will be putting our strips on the ships. And then our strips will be sold to the customer directly from them. Also, we are in contact with stores on the coast like CVS and Walmart to sell our product. Here's our five year pro forecast that shows our gross profit, our cost of sales and our revenue. Um, this is also our five-year plan forecast. So to make our product, it is $14.74. Our product will be sold at the price of $19.99. Which means that we will be making a profit margin of $5.25 per unit sold. Our cost of sales will be ranging from 100,000 year one to 1 million by year five. Adding employees onto our team, making sales and the market cost between $30,000 and $50,000 and product development at $10,000 to $30,000 and general administration at $0 since it will be taken care of by our team. So total operating costs will range from $40,000 to $80,000 starting year three to five. Very, it is very possible with our emergency market strategy that we'll be bringing in $100,000 to $500,000 in year one. So in 2019, we were at a business school e-academy and we created this product. Uh, we went to the competition and we prevailed through that and then COVID hit. So we haven't been able to actually expand on our prototype and advertise for it because of COVID. But now with this competition, it has gave our product a new life. Thank you very much. This has been Vahia Mer Mahia Verde and uh, our contact information is on the left. Thank you. Thank you. Gary Dovey from Penn Northwest. Uh, another excellent uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, let's say that you were able to come into funding and uh, what would be your timeline to, to start this uh, production of this uh, material? Uh, so we were actually looking in within a year, actually. Uh, so we do have an investor uh, as well. That investor does happen to be my dad. And if we were able to get some advertising help and able to push our product, he would be willing to uh, help, help us start off, help us start off. So for first year, no sales, correct? Uh, we haven't officially launched our product. Right. Yeah. So, so I'm saying once you, once you launch, uh, actually start producing, it would take almost a year or six months or three months to get the product out to, uh, the market. Oh, I would, I would say around six months. Okay. Well, thank you again. Excellent presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hi, this is Jeff Meyer with the e Center. Um, so yeah, good, very good presentation. Very easy to understand, uh, I guess my question is, you don't have any competition now, um, but what, what do you think the barriers to entry to, for a larger company to to, to uh, enter this market? Uh, what, what, what do you think is one of the barriers or are there barriers? Would it be hard to replicate your solution? No, it would not be hard to replicate our solution. But the way, so it is hard, it would be hard to get into this market, let's say. Like, how are you gonna sell aloe vera strips, right? Like they're just strips that you put on your tank top. Personally, that doesn't interest me at all. But what you really like, this is what we thought about, which is what uh, Ryder said, emergency marketing. So you're on a cruise ship, right? 
You need to take pictures. You want to wear clothes, but you can't because you're sunburned. And whenever you wear your straps on anything, the friction is terrible. So the emergency market means you need something right now, which would be the aloe vera strips, obviously our product. And they would be able to sell at whatever price that we put it at because the customer needs it. So I think that it would be hard to, it's even hard for us to get into this market because advertising is hard. But once you, if you are able to get it in the right places, I wouldn't say that it would be hard to sell at all. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So my, I have a couple questions. Um, are, are the strips, do they come in different sizes? Uh, yes. They'll be sold for a different variety of clothing articles. Like there's specific ones for your hats and they're also becoming like different sizes. Okay. And my main question is, you know, a large cost of business is marketing. So being that you are doing the marketing to the cruise lines and to the businesses, you said a business to business model. Um, I take it then that a cruise ship uh, or other business is going to have to absorb the cost of marketing this product to their target audience on that ship or wherever they are. Uh, because, you know, A, people will not know about them. Uh, and B, if they rely only for when people are in need, you know, that select few who would come or like, how would people even know these exist? Um, you know, in a, ahead of the game, the cruise ship would have to spend money advertising them. Yes. And um, like I said, we're also in talks with Coast, with stores on the coast like CVS and Walmart, who would also give us some additional marketing from that. Too. I I also think that the product does um, advertise for itself. So when people are looking for aloe, it would be in the same section. And that's how we get our advertisement mm -hmm. out there, as well as our own advertisement, saving us money, doing it on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, et cetera, uh, getting, getting it out to the people and starting, starting small and eventually starting small with advertisement. And then once we have it on the cruise ships, it will be more open to more people. So is that ship. part of your $5.25 profit margin? Yes. Advertising is uh, put into that. Profit, our profit margin. Or your, your, your costs. Is it it would be, yes, it, it's, it's in our costs, not our profit margin. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a few questions from the chat. The first one, are there any proprietary elements to your product that would differentiate you from a copycat? Do you want to go? Mm. So uh, since we are the first ones, uh, we plan to uh, get our, our formula through good, uh, good nature in Greenville. We plan to get our formula padded in so only we can use it for a certain amount of years. Also, we plan to be very, very diverse. Uh, as Ryder said, with our different sizes and able to have them on hats, swimsuits, flip-flops and tank top straps or dress straps. And we also want to have colors. So it's not an eyesore when you're looking at a white t-shirt and it's not like a green strap, it's white. So we're very diverse. And I think that it would be very hard to uh, replicate us in every single aspect. I also think that it differentiates us from a copycat because if they are going for just for the aloe and the healing part, we are also with the fashion part of it too. It's not only just helping your skin. Okay, thank you. I hope that answered the, the question in the chat. Uh, the second question is how many uses or strips would there be per $20? So your uses... Uh, we want to make it washable. Our prototype seemed to be able to be washed around five, six times, but we want to make it more than that. And also there are four strips per container, meaning there's a set of two and another set of two. And different sizes per container. Thank you for answering the question. Are there any other questions? 
Yeah, th this is Jeff Meyer again. I have one follow up question. Uh, are there any are there, are there any health risks at all? I, I, aloe, of course, in it by itself, I, I think not uh, in the strip itself, but um, is there any kind of health um, as far as the, um, any risks at all that have to be reviewed or analyzed or proven out uh, before this could go to, to market? Anything like that? Um, I don't, I don't believe so since that it's mostly just going to be the aloe inside of the strip and it's just going to be fabric. I don't think so, the aloe would be able to cause any problem like that. So our short, our short answer is no, but to give you a more defined answer, we are working with uh, good nature from Greenville. Uh, they right. specialize in skin and, uh, ointments. So our two main ingredients are aloe vera obviously because aloe strips and then calendula flowers, which she uses on her ointments. We infuse those in our strips. So there should be no health protocols at all while using this. Okay, I, I didn't think so. I just thought before anything is mass produced, anything that, that touches the skin, right? Uh, does it have to be looked at and reviewed? So that's all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay, great. Any additional questions at all? Uh, one question I have, um, how would they, with those two ingredients, how would it stick? Um, There's a special process that we researched where you put the aloe and the fabric together, but then you, it'll infuse when you wash it together. So the aloe itself will infuse inside of the fabric, staying inside of the fabric. So they're chemically bond, but if you were asking how would it stick to your, um, to your strap, uh, right. there, are, there are tiny magnets inside. So it goes over like a sleeve and clips on the one side. I wish we had our prototype with us, but it clips on the one. If this, if this was your sleeve right here, it would go over and clip with the tiny magnets and there wouldn't be any sliding. Okay. Thank you. I, I do have a question. Uh, it, it's about, you, you mentioned earlier um, the ability to wash this. And, and you, met, you just mentioned that um, through the washing process, your materials continue to fuse, I think is how you mentioned it. Uh, how would your product not be diluted during the washing cycle or, or something like that? Due to the, the calendula flower has a very strong chemical uh, reaction when it's infused with the aloe. So their bond is very tight. Uh, it's very like inseparable. So you're able to wash it multiple times with it still being effective. It does get to the point where it doesn't work after five washes, but six, if you're really pushing it, uh, so we want to expand off of that, but also that's washing with the aloe strips on. You can also take them off. Okay, I, I understand. Put them on another piece of clothing. Okay. Thank you very much for answering. Thank you. Okay, great. So uh, now I'd like to give the judges just a few minutes to um, score the presentation. And I'll also ask that the, um, the host of the Zoom room, um, go ahead and uh, open a breakout room for the judges so that they can discuss um, the scores.
Okay, everyone, we'll just have a few minutes break while the, the judges discuss.
Okay, now. Okay, I think we're all back. Uh, I think uh, we're just missing Georgia, so let's uh, give it her a few minutes. Okay. I think Georgia may have signed off. Yeah, because when it asked to, uh, the two maps, when it asked us to leave the room, the second request then was leave meeting. So if she hit that, she might have exited completely. Yeah, because I'm, I'm only seeing 10 participants and there was 11. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we just asked Georgia to reconnect. Oh, okay. Yep, Georgia's going to reconnect to the meeting. Yep, she's back already. Okay, great. Yeah, she's great. back, and we have the scores, so we're all good. Okay, perfect. So um, I'll ask one of the judges to go ahead and make the announcement with the, with the conclusion to the scoring. Okay, well, we have our tabulator. Um, that is Lisa Evans. So if, uh, unless she has shared that with Georgia, Lisa, could you announce the winner for us? I, uh, I shared it with you, Jeff. <laughs> oh, you shared it with me. Oh, okay. And Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't see the um, total. So, Jeff, if you want to go ahead and announce the winner. Yeah, but I'm not uh, seeing the chat yet. Oh, no, oh, not chat. Oh. oh, you sent it to me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, in your okay. Sorry. sorry. Oh, it was sent to me. No, I'm sorry, everyone. Is it in yeah, right here. Amen. Are we on? Yes, we are. Hmm. Oh, you sent it to my to teams. Here's my
one, we have a winner. Nope. We have a winner. First place, uh, second place will be Nikolai and first place is Sabrina. So congratulations. Congratulations, everyone. Congratulations. Thank you for participating this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for participating. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, and thank you all for presenting uh, excellent presentations. Better than TV. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. Very creative. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.